Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I wanna welcome you all to this webinar today. Uh, my name is Dr. Sarah Riccardi Swartz. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Recovering Truth Project in the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict at Arizona State University. In 2019, 2020, I was the National Endowment for the Humanities Orthodox Christian Studies Dissertation Fellow at the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University. I'm a sociocultural anthropologist of religion, politics, gender, and media. My co-organizer for this event is Dr. Candice Lukasik, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Dr. Lukasik is a sociocultural anthropologist of religion, race, and migration. In 2019-2020, Dr. Lukasik held the OCSC Fellowship in Coptic Studies. The Orthodox Christian Studies Center, co-founded by Dr. Aristotle Papanikolaou and Dr. George Dimakopoulos, is one of the most vibrant spaces for Orthodox Christian thought, not only in the United States, but globally. This is seen in its interdisciplinary work, its prestigious funding partners, and its ability to foster critical engagement with Orthodox Christianity that does not shy away from tough topics. And that's including the topic on the roster for today, the intersection of theology and anthropology. Before we begin, we must extend some thanks. Thank you to Aristotle and George for not only figuring out the logistics of our vision for this panel, but for always supporting social science scholarship in Orthodox studies. This support was particularly evident when both the 2019-2020 NEH dissertation and Coptic Studies Fellowships went to anthropologists. We also want to extend our deep thanks to Fordham University for all of the technical and administrative assistance, especially to Nate Wood and Kelsey Miles. And our deep thanks also goes out to Derek Lemons, the director for the Center of Theologically Engaged Anthropology at the University of Georgia. He's co-sponsoring this event and has been at the fore of interdisciplinary work in theology and anthropology. The impulse for this panel stems from our own work as anthropologists in Orthodox communities who have had to become in some respects, theologians along the way in order to understand the theological subjectivities that have shaped the lives of the people we work with. At the same time, we have had to find a way to engage in this interdisciplinary work in a field that has eschewed the inclusion of Christian theology, in part because of the Protestant elite roots of the discipline. While the anthropological study of Christianity has greatly expanded in the last 10 to 15 years, there still seems to be a disconnect as social scientists contend with taking seriously the social life of theology within the communities we study and in many cases are part of. In particular, the exclusion of orthodox theology in social science research has left us with a less than thorough understanding of contemporary orthodox practices and cultures. Anthropologists working in orthodox studies, mostly out of necessity, have begun to think through how to engage thoughtfully, critically, and for some who are also faith practitioners, reflexively with theological studies. Those of us who study Eastern Christianity from an anthropological perspective, are confronted with religious communities that integrate theologically differently into their everyday lives. The idea of a living theology requires us as scholars to be well-versed in theological histories, ideas, and controversies that are integral to orthodoxy in its various global formations. We must unpack the divergent histories of empire and memory in order to illuminate orthodoxy's contentious imperial historical imagination and discuss the ways in which these histories shape theological study and practice today. By taking theology seriously among interlocutors, social scientists can better interrogate the ways such things as orthodox prayer and ecumenical tension have the potential to be geopolitical spaces of religious mediation. To decouple our secular sensibilities from what is understood as religion, we must be able to inhabit a space where theology is inseparable from the everyday, guiding aesthetics, publics, and politics. Yet this need not be a one-sided endeavor. Theologians of orthodoxy have much to learn from anthropologists. 
not to mention sociologists, historians, and other scholars who work in Orthodox studies. While Orthodoxy might keep its theological mind's eye fixed on the early church fathers and the persecuted pasts and presents, it must also integrate political conflict, social change, and cultural discontinuity into its field of analysis. The socio and political complexities of the current moment require theologians to address deeply human problems in global contexts. If orthodoxy possesses a living theology, then it must be interwoven with the fabric of contemporary society, which means it needs to be holistic in its approach. In doing so, orthodox theology can become more attuned to the needs of its practitioners by examining how faith is lived out, not simply studied in seminaries or educational institutions. This is an exercise that also includes shifts in our methodology, our theory, and in the questions we ask of ourselves and others. This is a lot to think about as we listen to this esteemed group of scholars today. Now, Candice, I'm gonna pass this over to you for Q&A protocol and introducing our panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Um, just to go over uh, some Q&A protocol, please type your questions or comments into the Q&A feature at the bottom of uh, your Zoom. Uh, and the Q&A will take place after the panelists have had a chance to respond to Dr. Sonia and Thomas. Um, the Q&A would be, it will take about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and each of our panelists today will speak for 15 minutes with a response of 10 minutes from Dr. Sonia Thomas. Today, we have four panelists and a respondent. I'm gonna read the names uh, in order of the presentation. And after Dr. Sonia Thomas has finished her response, we'll open it up for Q&A. Angie Holm is a assistant professor of the, of the anthropology and sociology of religion at the University of Chicago. After receiving her PhD in anthropology from the University of California, Berkeley, she taught at Barnard College and held research fellow positions at Emory University and the Max Planck Institute for the, the Study of Religious and Ethnic Diversity. Based on fieldwork in Egypt, The Political Lives of Saints by, at the University of California Press uh, at 2018 is her first book. Alexandra Antohin is an anthropologist with over 10 years of ethnographic experience studying Orthodox Christian societies and has conducted fieldwork in the Russian Far East, North Central Ethiopia, and the Washington DC area. Alexandra completed her doctorate in social anthropology at University College London and has taught at George Washington University and Westchester uh, Community College. She serves as the Vermont Folk, Folk Life Center's Director of Education and previously worked as the Research and Program Director for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's uh, A Voice Virtual Library uh, Project, a digital archive dedicated to capturing Black legislative behavior in the United States Congress. Elena Vuola is Professor of Global Christianity and Dialogue of Religions at the Faculty of Theology, University of Helsinki, Finland. She is also the Vice Dean of International Affairs and Societal Relations of the Faculty. Her most recent publications are The Virgin Mary Across Cultures, Devotion Among Costa Rican Catholic and Finnish Orthodox Women, and Orthodox Christianity and Gender, Dynamics of Tradition, Culture, and Lived Practice, which she co-edited with Helena Kobari. Dr. Bethlehem Dejene is an Ethiopian born anthropologist researching in the areas of spiritual healing and etiologies of affliction within the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahido Church. Her research interests directly intersect with her life as a member and practitioner within the Orthodox Church and its hesychastic tradition. Our respondent is Dr. Sonia Thomas, Dr. Thomas is an assistant professor of women's gender and sexuality studies at Colby College. Her research examines the intersections of caste, race, gender, class, and religion in post-colonial India and community-based movements for minority rights. She is the author of Privileged Minorities, Syrian Christianity, Gender, and Minority Rights in Post-Colonial India. She has also written articles on education and religious minorities in India, the South Asian American diaspora, 
and comparative racializations and Black vernacular traditions in the US and globally. Sonia is Associate Director for South Asia Journal of South Asian Studies, and she is currently researching Catholic missionary priests from India serving in rural America. Uh, we have an amazing lineup today, and for now, I'm going to pass it over to Angie uh, to begin our discussion. Thank you. Hi, um, I hope you can see me right now. So thanks to Candace and Sarah for inviting me to participate in this important conversation on orthodoxy, anthropology, and theology. I'm an anthropologist by training with fieldwork experience in Egypt, which involved visits to Coptic Orthodox churches, monasteries, and seminaries. I'm also a faculty member in a divinity school where theology is one of our central disciplinary pillars among a mix of scholarly methods and commitments. And given my brief stint at Chicago, it's also been my experience um, that the interdisciplinary space is often one where the most substantive and fierce defense of disciplinary identities and boundaries can be found in a productive way. And so with some of these conversations in the back of my mind, I'll be sharing some thoughts on the relationship between anthropology and theology in the study of orthodoxy with a healthy dose of trepidation. And to do this, I'd first like to reflect um, a bit on my previous writings on Coptic Orthodoxy, emboldened by Candace's and Sarah's smart reviews of my work. I'd like to think openly and aloud here about what questions I would ask of my own previous research if I were charged to forge a dialogue between the social sciences and theology. And furthermore, I do this all in the, ultimately in the spirit of encouraging new lines of inquiry for future anthropologists of Orthodox Christianity who may be here with us now. So in my book, The Political Lives of Saints, Christian Muslim Mediation in Egypt, my goal was to analyze how Coptic Orthodoxy mediates social and political relations between Christians and Muslims in Egypt. I was primarily interested in what terms of belonging bound Christians and Muslims together under the nation state. And I went to linguistic anthropology and semiotics to explore the communicative potential for Orthodoxy to shape sites of interaction between Christians and Muslims. Orthodoxy, I came to discover, was deeply formative of how Coptic Christians inhabited space and time and imagined their relations to the Muslim majority. And so I began to see that Orthodox theology was formatively material in nature, fleshly, luminous, edgy, and abundant. Right and true practices of Orthodoxy or orthopraxy is intrinsically an exercise in ordering material relations between the visible and the invisible realms. My ethnography of orthodoxy is organized along three themes, three themes of Christian Muslim mediation. The first is community, the second is territory, and the third is public order. Each of these three themes is inspired by core theological doctrine of the Coptic Orthodox Church. The first is the theology of the Afkharistia, or the Eucharist. The second is the theology of the Theotokos, or the Virgin Mary, bearer of God. And the third is the theology of the icona, or the holy likeness. Throughout my book, I oriented my analysis of holy images and theology primarily toward problems of national and communal belonging. I found value in this use of theology to consider how orthodox theology organizes social life with political consequences for cops in Egypt. But here with you now, I'd also like to pivot and consider orthodox theology's intention with secular ontologies of social and political imagination. And perhaps along the way prompt some reflections on anthropology's methodological limits and potentials to engage theology. For all Christians, regardless of denomination, the theology of Christ's death and resurrection is the centerpiece of salvation. It also marks the beginning of the church and for social scientists, the institution of the true community. The Eucharist, or in Coptic Eleftharistia, refers to the liturgical act of giving thanks in exchange for a perfect sacrifice. In Orthodoxy, the Eucharist is the holy body and blood, the real presence of Christ, and the essential medium of the Holy Church's salvation. 
The Eucharist is the ultimate foundation of social and collective belonging, humanity's true origins, and the eternal mystery of the beyond. For an anthropologist seeking to take seriously theology on its own terms, the Eucharist is therefore a natural starting point for grasping the inside and the outside of a community. Acts of partaking in communion, abstaining from communion, and excommunication are all acts of creating the terms of being in common in Christ. They create a sense of holy community and for the Coptic Orthodox, the right and true terms of the Coptic community. Throughout my fieldwork, my identity as a non-Orthodox bystander outside the body politic of Christ's salvation was never more visible and marked than during the masses when I sat behind as others went ahead to commune. For some of my Coptic friends, my inability to take the Eucharist caused deep distress, regularly broadcasting my status as an outsider to the gates of heaven. Of course, distinctions between insider and outsider, native and guest, are perennial themes in social theory. How might the Eucharist change how anthropologists approach the intrinsically social and political question of who does and doesn't belong? A radically orthodox disposition may emphasize the totality of the holy body politic and its exclusionary force in the service of absolute truth. An equally orthodox commitment to Christ's body and blood may override the equally exclusionary principle of the ethnos, of the race and the soil that have long defined various people groups in anthropology. The Eucharist in orthodoxy is perfectly absolute and total, but its theological status as the mystery of mysteries also makes room for social ambiguity. No one knows, in short, who is communing at any given time and under what conditions. For example, I draw on the imagination of the desert hermits for all their social isolation who also took in the communion in caves and in secret. In my work on Christian Muslim relations, this theological possibility was intriguing and important for considering collective modes of belonging that lay outside the official institutions of ecclesiology. Communing in Christ's death and resurrection also means partaking in a communicative style of accessing holy blessings. If we take its material logic of distributing parts to whole, the Eucharist is also a style of reproducing and distributing holiness, baraka, to even those outside the baptized church. Here I think about all those times I didn't take the Eucharist, but took pieces from the prospora instead. In Coptic Orthodoxy, the urban refers to the remaining loaves that express Christian love and fellowship, even if they are not the consecrated elements themselves. One could make the same case for martyrs and the body parts of martyrs. They are also approximations of Christ's example of suffering, sacrifice, and salvation. Theology organize, organizes how people understand their salvation, the salvation of others, and where they are in the universal story of collective salvation. Theology can also bind a nation together or rend it apart. In my work on Coptic martyrdom, the Egyptian nation state is the overarching overarching framework for analyzing the politics of violence. But following the theology of the Eucharist further, we might also consider how death and sacrifice is imagined and valued beyond the framework of the nation and the Coptic community. This includes following the trans-Orthodox politics of common communion and common sacrifice. But it also includes taking seriously the Orthodox mystery of the body and blood and entertaining the social potential that non-Orthodox are also participating in signs of Christ's salvation. The Eucharist is the unique, uniquely Orthodox basis of the Coptic community, but at the same time, the Eucharist is a theological medium that organizes social relations between Orthodox and non-Orthodox. Its material approximations, such as baraka and the relics of martyrs, are potential vehicles of including outsiders, such as Protestants, Catholics, Muslims, into the Orthodox body of Christ. This anthropology of social potential is also intrinsic to Orthodox mysticism and its distinctive feature of divine, unfathomable hiddenness. So this brings me to the second doctrine in Orthodox theology that I'd like to engage with you this afternoon, the theology of the icon. 
The Ikaino Wager offers another important link for bridging conversations between theology and anthropology, embarking from the subfield of theological anthropology within theology. Anthropologists of Christianity have productively taken up the idea of the human being as the image of God. Following anthropologists of Protestantism, for example, this image of the human as the image of God may find expression in the subject of sincere speech, inner belief, and individual autonomy. Anthropologists of Orthodoxy, by contrast, explore how being made in the image of God relates to the icon imaginary and the principle of holy likeness, which mediates the invisible and the visible. This is in keeping with the orthodox theological teaching that the, that the true anthropos, the holy person, is a living icon. A social scientific approach to theological anthropology thus considers the social ontology of personhood in the image of God. This involves examining social styles of representation and interaction in ways that may mitigate against secular norms of what the human does and looks like. In my writings on Coptic icons, I focus less on the meaning of the icon and more on pragmatics of icon use and the social life of the icon. What is the orthopraxy of image veneration? How does icon theology play out in the social world of devotees and saints in the making? These questions led me to consider the social performance of holy mystery surrounding a holy person or a saint. This social performance includes a ritual script for dynamically transforming the saint into an icon. During my years of field work in Egypt, I learned that Christians and Muslims both believe that there are holy women and men walking in their midst, in their present. This public image of the holy saint is a dynamic and fragile one, which approaches, approaches the, th the threshold of the human and the divine. Humility he mitigates against the moral problem of, of idolatry or the excessive valuation of the human being. In orthodoxy, this problem finds a particular form of social expression in the interaction between the saint and his or her audience. The moral distinction between the icon and the idol, furthermore, is a performative one. If the crowd goes too far and the saint is lured in by their excessive evaluation, he or she enters into the fatal fate of becoming an idol. For this reason, the social performance of mystery, of hiddenness and concealment, is a moral necessity for keeping the saint safe in salvation. True to form, this mystery is central to an orthodox, specific theological anthropology. This distinctly orthodox genre of expressing the divine foundation of human nature offers one direction for a theologically engaged anthropology. The perilous frontier between human and divine natures is arguably what makes a Christian anthropology special and one may distinguish an anthropologist of Christianity's engagement with the moral terms of personhood and populism. And so on this point, I, I'd just like to wrap up and invoke some of my initial framings for my engagement with orthodox theologies of material mediation. Where might orthodox theology lie in productive tension with secular ontologies of social and political life? A theologically engaged anthropology, in my view, must move to consider how theology is lived and transformed within the context of the modern world. Issues fundamental to the making of nation states and churches, of citizenship, sovereignty, populism, minority politics, and authoritarianism, to name just a few, are integral to the life of orthodox theology. In my discussions of both the Eucharist and the Holy Icon, I've ended on the note of mystery for the Eucharist in the social specter of outsiders and for the icon in the moral idiom of humility. The next questions seems to me we need to ask are how various forms of orthodox mystery might shape a social vision of coexistence and what orthodox dynamics of truth and humanity can offer for our political imagination today. Thanks. Alexandra. Okay, can you see me? Great. Okay, so I'm really delighted to see this topic presented in this way. Um, it's really a testament to the corpus of ethnographic research projects that have even allowed us to bring together these diverse contexts of Orthodox Christianity together towards a theoretically minded conversation 
And it speaks so much to the movements within the anthropology of Christianity over the last 10 years or so that I've been observing it. And one of the key questions that particularly excites me, which is, is, is this question of how to cultivate an approach of theologically engaged anthropology, one that is, I assume, thread through the, throughout the research process. I say this because I have to admit that I have mostly, inter I have mostly integrated theological concepts at the analysis stage, uh, meaning that I spent time with the ethnographic material and then linked up with theological explanations later. Um, furthermore, I am more comfortable referring to the synonyms of theology in the way that I heard expressed in, in, among my interlocutors, such as terms like holy tradition, apostolic teachings, or generally the, the teachings of the church. In nearly all these variants, I would characterize any engagement that I've done as shaped by what I learned through people and not through text. Learning about theologically informed knowledge through people means those schooled on some level, whether through church training or self-directed. And in my main two ethnographic field experiences, Russia and Ethiopia, this was largely oral, what people learned from the priest, the deacon, the elder in their family or their social network, a sermon they heard, a radio or television program, comments written on a website or a forum. These are the entry points for defining what is theological and an ethnographic research of Orthodox Christians, as I see it. So in the time that we have, um, I wanted to present a few points of, of friction that I found persistent in my experience of ortho anthropological research with Orthodox Christian communities. And to sharpen this tension, I, I will be referring to anthropologists and theologians as sort of sides of, oppo as a, of, sides of opposing camps. Uh, in the sort of to in order to sort of efficiently establish some contrastive positions that allow us to arrive closer to a theologically engaged anthropology. And there's also another way to reflect on what I believe is the necessary role of those theologically trained by the church in this process. I'm also attempting to normalize um, speaking about the theologian or theologically informed as part of the contemporary Orthodox Christian scholarship. In some ways, I acknowledge that there's very much a certain awkwardness to this, uh, which doesn't exist for Western Christian scholarship. Um, but I believe a, theolo a theologian's take on contemporary Orthodox Christian life is in some ways an appropriate par parallel to the anthrop anthropologist's take. Uh, both operate within disciplinary thinking and approaches that frame their insights and their interpretation. So I want to start by sharing a common frustration that I experienced during my ethnographic field work. Um, and I, I say this because I feel like in some ways theological entangling uh, by the field worker can only uh, you know, go so far without the guidance of the church uh, or somebody who you know, directed as somebody who knows things about the church. So as an example, not too long ago, I, I followed in an online discussion on the Facebook forum of historical photos from the Horn of Africa that illustrates this point, I think. So a thread was started by, a, by an individual who defines himself as a believer, Orthodox Christian believer, um, and poses this question, uh, why is the Star of David found on Ethiopian Orthodox churches when it's primarily a symbol associated with Judaism? And the tenor and variety of responses to this query corresponded to patterns I experienced when asking for theologically informed interpretations in the field. A few respondents recited scriptural citations without commentary, uh, several others refer to the antiquity of Ethiopian Judaism and contemporary Ethiopian Jewish communities. One poster responded that he should really ask a qualified person, and another asked the person to clarify their question. Were they searching for evidence from archaeology? And if so, they should find a person more qualified to ask. And now this interaction is actually not particularly frustrating. In fact, it's, it's the anthropology re anthropologist revels in the inconsistencies and pluralities of interpretations. <clears throat> For them, complexity is evidence of human imagination, ingenuity, creativity. For the theologian, I suspect not as much, um, or at least the ones I encountered uh, in the field. Um, as I found, uh, var variation in multiple answers are fundamental to field work with the Orthodox Christians, but, but are generally disavowed by those theologically trained. One gets the sense that uh, the vernacularized theology is greeted with mild embarrassment by clergy. However, I want to focus on one of the variants provided by the Star of David discussion to go ask a more qualified person. Orthodox laity engage in a fair deal of self-regulating of theological knowledge. Such deference is not surprising in this religious context. Ethiopian Orthodox Church's approach to theology is one that is highly formalized institutional framework of spiritual revelation. 
However, I have observed just as much frequency of interpretation by individuals that church deems as theologically informed and hence more qualified. The main point here is that variations of theological answers exist always, um, but, mat but it matters most who says it. Which brings me to the title of what I've given this presentation, Anthropologists and Theologians Taking Believers Seriously. Um, I wanna ask what, what, what are ways that which believers everyday experience can have a place within the formalized institutional framework of the church and what they consider inclusive of their holy tradition. And as I impose this objective, I once again feel less comfortable referring to this as theology as a body of knowledge, as opposed to holy tradition for reasons I stated at the outset. So a few details about my ethnographic research with Ethiopian Orthodox Christians is necessary to argue for what I see as this tension between anthropological and theological knowledge. So my project was to observe the study of life of the church as experienced through common believers. Um, that is not clergy, despite many suggestions from locals that they would be the more appropriate source material. Uh, the, the study developed into an anthropological argument about the multiple variations of expressing the centrality of the covenant the God, you know, basically the definition being the God between a bond between God and His people, uh, and this centrality of the, of the covenant and devotional life of Ethiopian Orthodox Christians. And I positioned the ethnographic material on Saint Day celebrations, brotherhood and sisterhood organizations, uh, groups called Mahabars, uh, ordinary patterns of church going, genres of spiritual history, vow making on pilgrimage, as part of a, a broader collection of social, historical, and material and textual elaborations of this Ethiopian idea of, of the covenant. Um, despite my arrival to a theologically central concept, which happened organically through the ethnographic material that I evaluated much later writing up in London, I can say that there has not been much engagement from Orthodox Christians, lay or clerical. And there are several reasons I believe for this. Um, the limitations of Western scholarly formats hinder engagement from the start, I believe, which speaks to the occasional incongruity of intellectual traditions as they move cross-culturally. And this is particularly true for those who work in non-English populations. I would say that language is really not the only barrier, and I would say this for both sides, uh, uh, but also it's the methodolo methodology of argumentation. I would be curious to hear from this group about their experiences of handling how they, they communicate and disseminate their thesis or articles or scholarship with key contexts in the field and whether or not it was able to facilitate an engagement in, in ways that, um, that were satisfying or that were productive. The second point of friction um, refers to the pattern of not accepting the common believer as a source of orthodox and or theologically informed knowledge um, uh, as articulated to me by orthodox Christians. A core material of the ethnographic project uh, the local histories and testimonies of miracles attributed to covenants in their material form, what are referred to in the Ethiopian Orthodox tradition as tabots, I gathered from an assortment of, of, of sources, which included clergy. However, uh, these testimonies were often dismissed as folklore, a type of afatarik, uh, unlearned interpretations, or at worst, poor facsimiles of church teachings. Lastly, uh, my identity as an anthropologist, in some sense disqualified, I mean, some, in some cases, from engaging with the religious concepts. And I anticipated this response uh, to maintain discipline, disciplinary boundaries that contrasted between church guided teachings and those who are without such teachings. But, and there's always been this sort of tension of an orthopraxy for understanding the church that dislocates anthropological methods of interviewing participant observation and the field, field, field notes that result from these, from these uh, studies. And I would also add to this additional tension um, is this idea of a gendered component to this disengagement with, with sort of Orthodox Christian scholarship as developed in, in the Western scholarly tradition. And I never really took this, I never take this personally, but uh, it's an additional force that contributes to not taking ethnographic material on the social life of religious concepts seriously. Uh, and because I see theologically engaged anthropology as requiring ethnographic mediation, those theologically trained and informed will require participation and inclusion in this process. Um, so the dilemma here is how to get these individuals uh, to include believers everyday expressions of spiritual knowledge and experience um, is a question that's outstanding for me and will keep reoccurring as I conduct fieldwork studies. So, so far I've been fairly critical of the limitation of engaging with theology um, or vis-a-vis -vis those theologically informed. 
But I wanted to spend a few moments to speak about the work required of the anthropologists to generate sort of true current of exchange. To work towards a theologically engaged anthropology, the, anthropology, the ethnographer's sense of intersubjectivity a consciousness of their self needs to be more transparent and available for interrogation. Note here, I'm not really speaking about identity or positionality relative to the field workers interlocutors, topics more familiar within the debates of anthropological ethics. What I'm referring to is actually willingness to ask the same questions that so intrigued the field worker. Um, throughout my studies with Orthodox, with, with Orthodox Christians, I'm often asked, especially by priests, whether I pray every day. I receive this inquiry in multiple ways. Is this a question, an instruction, a prayer itself? Simultaneously, I've wondered how this inquiry is answered by non-Orthodox or non-Christians or non-believing anthropologists. Anthropologists, while no longer avowed atheists, remain safely distanced from religious identification. The question, how do you pray, does not need to be interpreted only as a membership test, but a real need to relate to that person spiritually. The ethnographer needs to provide an opening into, quote, a window to their soul as a means for their interlocutors to evaluate them as human beings. So my hope is that the church, represented by those theologically informed, uh, can expand their knowledge in epistemology to include a wide collection of wisdom and truth, wider collection <laughs> of wisdom and truths. Uh, a, consist a consistent barrier I encountered as a field worker is that heterodox schooling, even accidentally, is perceived by believers and especially vested members as a dangerous consequence of unguided learning. This threat is even more acute when applied to the anthropologist, alien to the culture, and as such barred from entering into the domain of spiritual knowledge. I found this pattern to, be, to, to play out repeatedly in Ethiopian Orthodox context, and in some sense in, in the Russian Orthodox context, uh, when I did field work in, in there, uh, where access to guided theological learning is highly stratified. This places enormous limitations on what can be studied ethnographically and whether this research can be read, commented on, discussed, and dialogued with. Turning to the politics of ethnography of religious concepts, why can't the atheist and ethnographer be a subject or recipient of revelation? Is it not the aim of the church as a guardian of the apostolic tradition to come face to face with unbelievers, the most in need of it. I say this somewhat playfully, but also in line with a central principle often communicated to me by Orthodox Christians during fieldwork activities, that spiritual knowledge ultimately must be guided, cultivated and earned. As I see it, the opportunity exists for both sides, the anthropologist and theologian as I've delineated to create a space for discourse shaped by interdisciplinary thinking. This can be a fruitful interaction to pursue. This can be a fruitful inter interaction to pursue, I argue. One that moves from seeking the church's institutional blessing and cooperation and towards building sustained collaborative understandings of the contemporary conditions that face everyday, everyday believers. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, hello, uh, thanks for inviting me to join this uh, wonderful discussion. I'm joining you from Helsinki, Finland. Uh, so I say good evening to everybody. Uh, I'm a theologian by training who has been doing uh, ethnography, not necessarily in the full sense of the word as you who are anthropologists would use it, but I felt a necessity at some point in my research to learn ethnographic methods, basically interviewing. Uh, I have been doing this kind of theological ethnographic research in two different contexts. Among Catholic women in Costa Rica, Central America and Orthodox women in Finland. Uh, my book uh, from last year actually covers both fields. In both contexts, my primary interest was the meaning of the Virgin Mary for believing Catholic and Orthodox women. 
The two contexts differ in many aspects, obviously, but many of my results turned out to be surprisingly similar, especially when it comes to the gendered aspects of women's devotion uh, to Mary. Uh, I have to say that among my informants, there was also uh, some uh, Skolt Sami women, uh, one of, which is one of the smallest indigenous Sami tribes in uh, uh, northeastern Finland who are Orthodox by religion. So that actually brought an interesting uh, further aspect to my, uh, to my research. Uh, by and large, uh, the Orthodox tradition has not been as researched from a lived religion or uh, and a gender perspective as other Christian traditions. Why this is so and what are the consequences is not the subject of my talk. My point is rather that empirical research, whether done by scholars of religious studies and sociology of religion or anthropology, could be more cognizant of orthodox theology in different contexts. This theology is not singular, even when there is possibly less variation than in Western churches. In my interviews, I consciously focused on my informant's theological thinking. Based on my earlier research in Costa Rica, I assumed that rather than asking Finnish Orthodox women how they see their role and position in the church, asking about mother of God would be an easier, less tendentious task that would pro provide a richer window on women's lives. And indeed, this is exactly what happened. Almost without exception, at some point in the interview, the women started talking about issues of gender hierarchy, sexism, women's position in the church, and so on, exhibiting a variety of opinions and positions on these issues. The women I interviewed had different ways of negotiating the gender teachings of the Orthodox Church as women, and Mary was an important part of this negotiation. Due to the meagerness of feminist theology in the Orthodox tradition, Ordinary women do not have a similar theological basis for their critique of certain practices and teachings compared with women in the Catholic Church and most Protestant churches. Many of the women I interviewed uh, for this project expressed critical views on the basis of their lived experience as women. They expressed a multitude of theological thoughts and ideas, sometimes questioning the teachings of the church. These were related, for example, to purity issues, women's lack of authority in the church, and the historically male-dominated way of interpreting Theotokos, which was the focus of my research. Women thus both maintained a distance from the form from formal teachings of the church, but also at times affirmed, affirmed them. Because of the meagerness of feminist reflection, uh, theological reflection in the Orthodox tradition. I think it is possible to gain more insight on, into Orthodox women's self-understanding and theological reflection through ethnography and interviews. Uh, lay women uh, who are, women are always lay people in the Orthodox church, are also theological thinkers. Especially in religious traditions such as the Catholic and the Orthodox, in which women hold less power and right to interpretation than men, it is important to understand how also women create, produce and reproduce theological ideas. I would say that religious agency includes uh, this kind of theological agency that we should be attentive to. Uh, in order to understand our informants, uh, we need to understand the core theological doctrines and the, their development over time. We should study both practices and doctrines. Methodologically, this means at best the ability to combine theological and eth ethnographic methods without creating a false dichotomy and value hierarchy between them. 
uh, a scholar of religion, Anne Blackburn, makes a similar point in her analysis of the relationship between textual and empirical analysis of religion. Let me quote her. There is a danger that the turn to studies of ritual and everyday life, especially in the context of an apologetic retreat from the study of texts, leaves scholars of religion in an intellectually untenable position. We may fail to recognize the often profoundly influential connections between texts and devotional practice, for example, and to neglect the very high value accorded to textual composition, transmission, and interpretation within the communities we seek to understand." Unquote. She does not speak of theology as such, since she is writing about Thai Buddhism, but in my view her point is just as accurate, or even more accurate, in the case of Christianity. Since the authority of ancient texts is considered normative in these textual religions. Their theology is drawn from and interpreted on the basis of these texts. For Blackburn, textual interpretation is an essential part of religious renewal. In my view, this includes interpretations from the point of view of gender. Theology, including feminist theology, is not only an academic uh, endeavor, but also an individual and communal way of reflecting intellectually on one's faith and beliefs. This always takes place on a continuum of tradition, and continuum includes both continuity and change. This kind of scholarly attentiveness means locating theology and theological thinking in speech when it occurs. Mariology is a case, of, case in point. Even less educated lay people in different Christian churches are usually aware of theology concerning Mary. This is especially true in a country like Finland, where women are highly educated. The, their high level of education corresponds, corresponds with their knowledge of their religion. Feminist theology has questioned the traditional exclusion of women from the sacred by claiming women's full humanity as imago Dei. Theology pays special attention to this sim symbolic dimension of religion, and in the case of its feminist critique, its deep sexism. In feminist theology, there has always been a keen interest in women's everyday experiences. However, there is a gap between what is said about women's religious experiences on the one hand, and the methods used to sustain those claims on the other. By this I refer mainly to the absence or meagerness of ethnographic methods, of which feminist theologians have not made extensive use. The emphasis has been on the interpretation of texts, doctrines and traditions. Greater and deeper multi and interdisciplinarity in the study of religion, especially in the case of gender and religion is important. Anthropologists, historians and sociologists of religion could dialogue much more with theologians and vice versa. Gender theorists, especially from the social sciences, should be more knowledgeable of feminist study of religion when making claims about the relationship between women and religion. Ethnographers then should be more knowledgeable of theology in the case of gender and women, especially feminist theology. And theologians, including feminist theologians, should broaden their methodological toolkit to include insights from ethnographic research or even learn to do it themselves like I did myself. Historically, most changes in religious traditions do not happen due to a new doctrine produced by the institutional elite or hierarchy. It is much more common that the influences from the bottom up, lived religion of ordinary people, including women, turns into a doctrine, sometimes much later, as the historical development of Mariology makes clear. More importantly, however, the struggle between continuity and change in any religious tradition gains its impetus among the ordinary faithful. 
some teachings are questioned for being outdated or uh, oppressive. New groups of people appear as subjects demanding more visibility. New theologies emerge, whether because of these demands for theological subjectivity or because societal and political changes, uh, and these, of course, overlap and are related. Understanding this dynamic of continuity and change, which has theological issues and interpretation, interpretations at its heart, is important also when we do ethnographic or empirical research. We should not arbitrarily cut off theological ideas because they are often part of our informant's self-understanding and their negotiation with their religious tradition. At least in the three monotheistic religions, people's ways of thinking theologically and interpreting their traditions core teachings are central to their religious identity and should not be ignored. Otherwise, a false divide between belief and practice may follow. Some of the perspectives of lived religion have been useful for my research, particularly those that focus on the material, the bodily and gendered aspects of religion. However, I would like to point out, unlike most scholars of lived religion do, that also institutions, dogmas and power hierarchies are as much lived as ordinary people's rituals and practices. Lived religion is not just about immanent, religiously informed practices. It is also about transcendence and how individuals and communities relate to it. Both the lived, the ordinary, and the doctrinal or institutional do change, even if slowly, when tradition is reinterpreted and challenged. Among anthropologists, there is a recent process of re-evaluation of the field's relationship to the study of religion and especially of Christianity. Scholars such as Joel Robbins are suggesting more dialogue between anthropology and theology. I'm aware that the field has developed uh, since Robbins' early article. Others are engaging in a critical rereading of the history of anthropology as a kind of denial of Christianity. Uh, curiously, some scholars who have been especially important for the dialogue between theology and ethnography, like, J like James Bielo and Robert Orsi, are not usually dialogued with by, by anthropologists of Christianity. Relatedly, the by now well-established research tradition of lived religion seems not to enter much into the anthropological theorizations of religions, religion, even when most studies done under the lived religion concept is empirical. How then does anthropology of Christianity in fact differ from empirical or ethnographic research on Christian communities done in religious studies uh, theology or sociology of religion. And finally, when an anthropologist of Christianity wants to employ more theological questions in her or his research, it is important to know the other, the other field well enough. Let me take an example. Joel Robbins, in his interest in creating more dialogue with theology, starts this dialogue with a theologian who has written an extensive volume on theology and social theory. Robin seems, however, to be unaware that this theologian, John Milbank, is in the field of academic theology, the primus motor of the so-called radical orthodoxy movement, which rests on several problematic assumptions of both theology, religion, and society. It is a very church-driven, mainly Catholic or Anglican project, which has a nostalgia for the lost role of the church in society, stemming from a critical view of contemporary democratic societies as unsuccessful product, products of liberal secularization. This is, of course, to say the least, a very problematic view from the perspective of women, minorities, uh, uh, and other people. 
the theology of Milbank and other radical orthodox scholars. And in, in this sense, it doesn't mean orthodoxy uh, as Eastern orthodoxy we are discussing today. They call the movement radical orthodoxy. It is very confessional, normative, anti-liberal and very Eurocentric. Thus, one must ask why Robbins chooses to start his dialogue with theolo theology, exactly with Milbank, taking him as the representative of contemporary theology and not, let us say, scholars of lived religion or liberation and feminist theologians. Thus, the new openness and mutual critique between different disciplines needs to stem from both a self-critical re-evaluation re of one's own discipline and its specific history in relation to other fields, and a critical ability to evaluate the different tendencies, epistemologies, and even political goals within the field, which is not one's own. One of the great outcomes of interdisciplinary work is one's greater self-reflexivity in one's truth claims. Obviously, I think all of what I have tried to say in this paper also has relevance in the context of Orthodox Christianity. As I already mentioned, it has been less studied from a lived religion approach or gender perspective than most other Christian traditions and churches. Thus, it is obvious that we should ask what kinds of theological views inform our research of orthodoxy, how they may differ from Western Christianity, and how those theological views affect issues of gender, ethnicity, nationality, and so on. For example, Finland is a very specific context for orthodox Christianity locally. It both shares much of the common history, tradition, and theology of global orthodoxy, but at the same time presents uh, an orthodoxy very different from, let's say, the neighboring Russia. Based on my research with Finnish Orthodox women, it seems that what affects the dialectic of continuity and change in, Finni in the Finnish Orthodox Church are the shared gender ideals of the entire society, as well as women's high level of education which includes their ability to negotiate with doctrinal and theological issues. To give an example, the Finnish Orthodox Church has simply dropped some practices that the faithful consider outdated, pastorally problematic and sexist, such as purity regulations and churching, the custom of bringing only boys to the altar at 40 days of age. At the same time, contemporary Orthodox theology has not created or even much reflected on such important ecumenical movements as political theology, contextual and liberation theologies, or feminist theology. Thus, an anthropologist or anyone doing empirical research on orthodoxy has a narrower reservoir of theological thinking than one has in the case of Catholicism, for example. This complicates the dialogue between disciplines. When Robin speaks Milbank as his dialogue partner from theology, without any contextualization or argument for this choice, the problem is that a multitude of uh, theological positions, uh, which may be in direct contrast with each other, are render, is re rendered invisible. If there is not a multiplicity of theologies and theological positions in orthodox theology, the problem for interdisciplinary dialogue may be inverse. The theology one wishes to dialogue with may end up being the authoritative institutional doctrinal truth claims, not academic theology, which would include lived religion approaches and critical theologies such as feminist theology. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Um, just to remind everybody, if you could um, place any questions that you have in the chat box below, and we're going to go on to our last panelist, uh, Bethlehem. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll be sharing my screen just to uh, make sure that it's easier to follow along. Hi, 
everyone. My name is Bethlehem Hailu Dejene, and I have completed my uh, PhD at Northwestern University in 2016. And my, eth my ethnographic work focuses on spirit possession and exorcism, especially in Addis Ababa. And I am grateful that uh, Dr. Antohen is given a talk before me, this helps me contextualize a lot of my ethnographic work within Ethiopia, especially topics that Dr. Antelheim had mentioned was uh, vernacular theology, covenant thinking, how Ethiopian Orthodox think of themselves covenantly tied to not only Judaism, but a certain type of uh, orthodoxy. So keeping these things in mind, I will be presenting a sketch of ethnographic uh, uh, data that I've collected between 2010 and 2019 during short trips to Ethiopia. And this will be regarding the, um, I will be focusing on fasting during Holy Lent as an act of faithful work, as an act of a life of prayer. So if most of us Google in these these days, um, Ethiopia keeps coming up as one of the most religious countries. Um, here on Wikipedia and some of the Pew researchers show that Ethiopians consider religion as very important to them. So in this highly faithful community, how do we understand diversity of religious practices? So in this case, I'm taking fasting in Addis Ababa as an ethnographic lens through which I examine levels of spiritual commitment in contemporary Orthodox Christians residing in Addis Ababa. So for our Orthodox Christians in Addis Ababa, and I'm being very specific with Addis Ababa because it has its own particular constraints as an urban uh, uh, ethnographic context. So this is seen mostly as restrictions around food, uh, accompanied by private and communal prayer. This could include worship at church, including attending divine liturgy, performing prostrations, whether at home or uh, at church, doing charitable works, visiting monasteries, or withdrawing to monasteries for a period of time while the Lent fast is happening. This could also include partaking in the sacraments and if possible, making pilgrimage to Jerusalem as being a culmination of a fast. And most older people um, tend to make this uh, pilgrimage to Jerusalem to take uh, Holy Eucharist at the conclusion of Holy Lent fast. And I just witnessed that this past, um, in 2019 in uh, Jerusalem, there were lots of Ethiopian, mostly of older crowd with coming with organized tours to, uh, to make a final liturgy or take communion in the holy city of Jerusalem. Some people choose to withdraw from social life. This means also taking time from work. Uh, some people take time uh, and break from alcohol and cat consumption. Cat is a, a, certain, a, a, a narcotic that is chewed by a wide number of younger Ethiopians. Some focus on getting healthier and regulating their blood sugar levels, cutting meat consumption, or just a humanitarian need to co-suffer with the poor through temporary deprivation of long hold steer. These are some of the practices that are included in what I consider fasting during Holy Lent and Addis Ababa. So if we use a the theolog theologically engaged ethnography, how do you make sense of all these practices that can all fall under the description of fasting? And how does ethno theologically engaged ethnography help us understand what the beliefs and motives that drive all these community of believers who identify under the one name of Orthodox Christians, but they exhibit diversity of practices. So what beliefs, motives, and goals affect the type and extremity of ascetic labors chosen by the believers to undertake this during this period of Holy Lent? And I would like to remind you that Holy Lent in Ethiopia is fasted for 55 days. I think the Ethiopian Orthodox calendar has one of the most rigorous and um, uh, aesthetic uh, uh, fasting calendars compared to all the Orthodox churches. So 55 days of taking these kinds of aesthetic labors. 
so these are some of the questions that guided my research or, or helped me organize my ethnographic observation throughout these years. What are the implicit and explicit theologies of Orthodox fasting that guides the various degrees of aesthetic commitments all the way to going to Jerusalem to just um, quitting drinking for a period of 55 days? What are the theologies that drive the degree of commitment during Holy Lent? And how do people's religious activities affect social life, at least during this period. So I consider fasting as a form of laboring, following mostly the church fathers. Why is Orthodox fasting, Orthodox Christian fasting necessary? I mean, we, we start with the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the centrality, and he had set the example of fasting in the gospels and taught his disciples to pray and to fast. Here I call uh, Father Milan Savic, who, um, gives us a nutshell understanding of Christian Orthodox Christian fasting. I'll quote him here. Here we should mention that fasting in the Orthodox Church has two aspects, physical and spiritual. The first one implies abstinence from rich foods such as dairy products, eggs, and all kinds of meat. Spiritual fasting consists in abstinence from evil thoughts, desires, and deeds. The main purpose of fasting is to gain mastery over oneself and to conquer the passions of the flesh. It is to liberate oneself from dependence on the things of this world in order to concentrate on the things of the kingdom of God. It is to give power to the soul so that it would not yield to temptation and sin. According to Saint Seraphim, fasting is an indispensable means of gaining the fruit of the Holy Spirit in one's life and Jesus himself taught that some forms of evil cannot be conquered without it. And St. Basil and St. John Chrysostom also emphasized this important aspect of prayer and fasting as part of Christian dedication um, in Orthodox Christianity. So my community of Lenten laborers, as I call my interlocutors, were overwhelmingly grouped between 18 and 40 years old. They came from all types of different educational and economic backgrounds and gender differences as well. So this is a, a schema of the types of people that I had spoken to, public and private high school students, daily wage earners, wage earners, uh, economically well-off housewives, uh, people who are able to afford to live on their own or with roommates, this is quite a new phenomenon in Addis Ababa, as people who are able to afford to leave their family house and set up houses for themselves. This is a new phenomenon. University students, married householders with children, housemaids, public servants, cab drivers, fruit and vegetable star workers, cafe bartenders, and expat Ethiopians who are visiting or who have resettled in Ethiopia after having lived abroad for a number of years. So I'm looking at what are these theologies of fasting that give us this diversity of practices? For what or for whom do we labor? I see two belief systems mer emerging out of this desire to labor through these 55 days of fasting. One, I generally just call it the Christ-centered belief system. The other one, the body-centered belief system. And these are just terms that I'm using to help me navigate, but they, these are not stable terms. They're not opposing terms at all. And these beliefs overlap over one another in the way that believers have described their beliefs and motives and intentions for why they're fasting during Holy Lent. Here are some of the statements that I consider more Christ-oriented. I suffer with Christ. Christ has suffered for me. It is good to follow the example of the life of Jesus Christ. My family has always been Orthodox Christian who fast, so I've learned to go to church and fast with them. I feel peaceful when I fast. I love the peace of monasteries. I take the time to reach out to my spiritual father to ask questions during this time. I try to fast longer until the end of divine liturgy, which is usually around 3 p.m. So that means people keep close to 20 hours of fasting if they're dedicated to also celebrating the divine liturgy. I break fast only after divine liturgy rather than doing it at noon where some people who have to go to work cannot attend divine liturgy tend to break fast during midday. 
it is better for me to eat vegan meals because my friends are devout Orthodox who keep fast. This is in solidarity. I feel happy to share food or money with street children. I look forward to celebrating Fasika, which is, which is Holy Pascha, because I've been truly doing my best to pray and fast. I feel that Christ is healing my body through fasting. And fasting prepares me for the afterlife. And I feel encouraged to persevere in religious life. And these are what I call the body-centered theology of fasting. These are some of the views that were expressed. When I fast, I get the opportunity to feel hunger and to try to understand the pain of the poor on the streets. It is not healthy to eat meat at all the, all the time. It is a good time to challenge myself to abstain from alcohol, chats, tobacco. Well, as long as it's vegan, I can have dessert and a macchiato. So this is expressing substitutions. Uh, Ethiopians don't eat butter or ghee, so there's oil substitutions or soy milk substitutions as Ethiopia opens up and more uh, products from outside of Ethiopia are able to come in and people are able to afford to buy these things. There's a choice to default to veganism as well. I'm also using this time to lose weight. There's concern with using this time also to achieve something besides a spiritual gain. There could be physical gains as well. It is also important to take care of the body, which is considered the temple of God. It is good to do compassionate work through almsgiving and supporting religious institutions during Holy Lent. And my doctor has recommended that I regulate my blood sugar levels. So I'm doing double act by, um, having a spiritual orientation as well as a health orientation towards holy fasting. So how do my interlocutors, these laborers during Holy Lent measure their goals, how successful they are? It depends on their beliefs and motivations. How does one bear 55 days of not only veganism, but also body disciplines like prostrations um, and fa fasting? longer hours from 17 hours to 24 hours or limiting the types of food items one uses. The other one would be not scandalizing neighbor, although one is not dedicated to the degree that they fast 20 hours, but they're dedicated and not scandalizing their neighbor. So they don't eat meat in front of their co-religionists or they share meals where they don't create temptation for the person who is fasting Holy Land. It could be measured by the number of kilos lost, the peace gained, the satisfaction gained in charitable works and a deepening relationship with Christ. One entering out of temporal time into eternal time, rejuvenation, transformation, increased intention to committed religious life and regulated blood and sugar levels. There have been scientific studies showing that Orthodox fasting actually has positive health effects. The ability to give others what would have been consumed if it were not for fasting, like milk and products, and its products, meat and butter. In Ethiopia, you, in Addis Ababa, you live with Muslim co-religionists who could benefit from these products when Orthodox Christians are not engaged in consuming um, products from animals. And continued commensality is one of the measurement goals. So what are the social effects of fasting during Holy Land? Fasting, could be done only to maintain communality. Even if it doesn't have higher spiritual aspirations, it could just be done to maintain communality where everyone engages some kind, in some kind of vegan fasting to support their um, co-religionists. Fasting not to scandalize uh, neighbor being one of it. Avoidance of community to fast longer and not to burden others. For example, those who can fast until three, they choose to forego meal time so that they could fast longer hours, maybe even to 5 p.m. This depends on the commitment of the believer. So single dwellers also expressed that it was easier to fast when that they had lived with their families, but living as single individuals, it's become harder to maintain fast much more rigorously. So for in concluding for ethnographers, although fasting during Holy Land is a widespread practice, theologically engaged research is what enables us to identify the beliefs and motives that shape the degrees of commitment to which individuals and families undergo in their Lenten practices. And for theologians, although 
those who are dedicated to fasting during Holy Lent are many, they are not a monolithic group of Orthodox Christians. As believers, Orthodox Christians in Addis Ababa vary greatly in their understanding, commitment, and practice of fasting during Holy Lent. Ethnographically engaged anthropology reveals the varying degree of pious practices undertaken to labor during Holy Lent by understanding the competing theologies that provide the motivations for Orthodox Christians, clergy and theologians can better understand and support their flock. Are all forms of spiritual labor equal? How will theologians communicate correct theology to Orthodox adherents? In conclusion, many Orthodox Christians are laboring in their own way. The question that interests us as scholars and theologians is, how do believers frame their faith practices? Understanding their beliefs, motives, and goals could help us have a deeper insight. Possibly some of the future trajectories into this work could be uh, understanding the theological telos for some of the religious practices that are done by Orthodox Christians. How does the teachings of the Holy Fathers and the gospel is interpreted in vernacular theology? How do the body-centered self-help books, for example, intermittent fasting versus Holy Lent fasting, how do these two things overlap? Different ideas of fasting, but they come from different theological underpinnings. Uh, the least pious and external practices does not mean this person or this practitioner is less orthodox. Theologians can empathize with those who struggle with their brother and neighbor, at least by not eating meat. And the last thing for us as scholars would be, how do we create intelligibility where we don't get lost in jargons between anthropologists and theologians? Because I myself find myself to be as an orthodox Christian practitioner, who is also an anthropologist. So how do we write for our interlocutors where we don't get lost in the language of anthropology, but how do also theologians make theological concepts accessible to us so that we can work with them as anthropologists? Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Bethlehem. That was wonderful. Um, so finally, we'll go to Sonia Thomas. Okay, so I just wanted to first um, thank Nate and Kelsey for all the work that they did putting this together. And then to Candace and Sarah, um, most, if people don't know, this panel was canceled in, in the height of the, the beginning of COVID. So to organize everything and then to reorganize everything for today, I know it's so difficult. Um, and I'm so glad that this, is, this was able to happen. Um, and also to our panelists, to Angie, Bethlehem, Elena, and Alexandra, I'm really honored to be part of a, in the company of scholars who are bringing these two things together, theology and the anthropology of Orthodox Christianity. Um, my comments are, are just going to be as brief as possible because I, I can already see that there's so much in the chat, in the Q&A. Um, and I, it's going to be more epistemological in nature. Um, I want to start off by acknowledging the heavy lifting that every one of our panelists has done. Um, every one of our panelists today is, are really interdisciplinary. Um, and I, I don't use that term lightly. I think we just throw out that term interdisciplinarity all the time in academia. Every disciplinary trained scholar I know tells me that their work is interdisciplinary. I think because you know, we, we desire to be interdisciplinary, but most of the time what we call interdisciplinary work is what I kind of consider multidisciplinary. Um, maybe like two disciplines holding hands for a while, like the anthropologist goes to the archives and we call that like an anthropologist is doing historical work, therefore it's interdisciplinary. But how I see interdisciplinarity is that it critiques the boundaries of disciplines. It talks about the gaps between disciplines, but then it does something more. It tries to bridge those gaps to create new root metaphors of analysis. And every one of our panelists today is doing that type of work on their research on Coptic Orthodox, Ethiopian Orthodox, and Finnish Orthodox Christians. It requires a kind of mapping of knowledge production and as Elena explained, a kind of self-reflexivity 
of one's place as a researcher in relation to numerous different methods. Um, I think when we as audience members come across true interdisciplinarity, it's just so fascinating to hear. Um, and I think that's all why we want to all claim to do it, but um, don't do that whole heavy lifting ourselves as our panelists have done today. Almost every academic I know, including myself, also tends to love to think about intellectual histories, but then to research intellectual histories and write about them is a different matter. To explain to our audiences why anthropology and theology are not in conversation, or I think what the papers here did today more accurately, what theologically engaged ethnography can and should look like. All of our panelists are giving us a background in the intellectual histories and trajectories of both theology and anthropology of Orthodox Christianity. As Angie explains, religious studies itself is characterized by hierarchical disunity of multiple fields, which makes it so that they resemble, quote, a federation of fiercely independent disciplines rather than a gestalt of methods in robust and mutually edifying dialogue, end quote. To have a gestalt of methods in robust dialogue requires the scholar to have enormous breadth. It's even made more difficult because interdisciplinary scholars often get critiqued because of a potential lack of depth in a traditional discipline. Um, I hear that encapsulated in the disparaging question used to knock interdisciplinary scholarship down to the ground, um, which is this question, who is the audience for your work? Well, in this case, first for the papers that we heard here, it's religious studies, anthropology, history, theology, sociology, women's studies, area studies, like Middle Eastern studies and African studies, all at once. So that's incredibly difficult. As the papers here have shown today, theology is intensely important for any scholar of religion, but it's especially be, may be the case for minority religions like Coptic Orthodox, Finnish Orthodox and Ethiopian Orthodox Christian. Because theology in that case with the, with the consideration of minority religions becomes about carving out a space for the minority community in the face of a dominant majority community, theology's deep textual analysis and historical engagement flushes out the why of lived religions, not just for those inside the faith and practitioners, but those outside the faith as well. As Bethlehem papers, Bethlehem's paper explains, quote, theologically engaged research is able to penetrate into the beliefs and motives of Ethiopian Orthodox Christians. Further, theology helps us understand the mystical part of what Angie is calling the mystical publicity of contemporary Coptic saints in Egypt. As Elena outlines, it is feminist theology that pays specific attention, not just to the symbolic dimensions of religion, but to how patriarchal interpretations of texts lead to concrete acts of sexist harm for women within religious traditions. And as much as theology is important, it may not get us into the everyday. That is the realm of anthropology. Anthropology lets us see how religious interactions are in larger political contexts. As Angie's paper shows us, the theology of icons can be a potential point of dialogue between theology and anthropology. The public image of a holy person is created from a, a type of social interaction. And quote, without an anthropological eye towards the dynamics of social interaction, the theologian might miss the intrinsic social quality of ascetic withdrawals, end quote. Thus, as Elena tells us, Method can, the anthropological method, ethnography, can help us think through the circulation of images and modes of belonging. Interviews can help us understand women's, women's experiences beyond text, doctrines, and tradition, and to understand how Mariology is lived. Likewise, Bethlehem has shown us how experiences are embodied, allowing us to understand the practicing body within religious traditions, and how the faithful can identify with the suffering of Christ's body, and with the suffering of others' bodies. 
despite all this and the goodness of it that anthropology can get us to, there is and can be a hierarchy of knowledge production. As Alexandra so powerfully reminds us in her paper, theologians can act as gatekeepers, providing a problematic and all-encompassing authority over knowledge production in Orthodox Christianity that ethnographers may be forced to engage with whether they want to or not. Thus, Alexandria rightly explains that, quote, variation and multiple answers are fundamental to field work within Orthodox Christians, but then these are then disavowed by those who are theologically trained, end quote. So given these tensions, the gaps, the separate federations, hierarchies, folk practices of religion versus the learned skills of those who do textual analysis, I'm really captivated by Alexandra's second question, especially, can anthropologists and theologians dialogue with one another? Is it even possible for this to happen? So I return again to where I started a little bit of my comments in awe of the heavy lifting that all of our panelists have done. Each and every one of our panelists has clued us into what theologically engaged ethnography looks like and how to make this dialogue happen. Questioning both the boundaries of theology and anthropology and also bridging it, allowing us to see it to have a deeper sense of place, time, and experience of Orthodox Christianities. For to quote Angie, spheres of publicity, both the national and the mystical, are not separate, but deeply interconnected. Um, so I actually did have individual questions for all of the panelists, but like I said, I, I'm mindful of the time and look at how many Q&A questions we have already. So I wanted maybe just to, to, to ask a general question. And it's kind of um, two general questions, but they're related to each other. Um, it gets at the idea of power in the academy and again, our kind of epistemologic in nature. I've been thinking what it means for researchers today to study Christianity in this particular moment, to confront fascism, patriarchal, racist, casteist, settler colonial and colonial histories embedded in Christianity and in our con continuing present. Um, questions that I think Angie was bringing up at the end of her paper. I'm also thinking about how anthropology continues to battle its colonial roots. So, Given that, I was wondering if the panelists could also talk about theolo how, if, poss if it's possible, to the theologically engage in ethnography on Orthodox Christianity to speak to or not, or dismantle or not, these white supremacist, settler colonialist, casteist, Western-based academic knowledge production. And a tiny bit related to that, like, right now in the midst of COVID, so many institutions are dealing with issues of budget cuts. And when we have budget cuts in disciplines, departments can really entrench themselves. You'll start to see things that say, well, we need somebody who does traditional methods. Um, so I, I, I was wondering if you could speak to the need for theologically engaged ethnography right now, especially in the midst of COVID budget cuts to religious studies departments, and also the exploitation of contingent labor on the market, on the market right now. So, um, and again, I have individual questions too, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Sonia. I actually would really like to start with that question if um, fellow panelists would like to answer. Maybe I'll start just speaking about the types of challenges I had as a graduate student and when I was writing my dissertation. And this was a huge uh, limitation in theological, uh, theoretical offerings from anthropology in terms of helping me frame a Christianity that is different than Western Christianity and an African Christianity, which has a long history with Judaism. So, even the closest uh, comparison, say for example, the, the Coptic experience within the African continent, even that has not was not enough for me as a theological framing to help me interrogate deeper and serious matters where I was observing uh, in my engagement with my interlocutors. And just like Dr. Antonin said, it worked for me to work maybe in reversal rather than 
having a theoretical position. It was my ethnography that was informing my theoretical position. So because I was very much stuck in a Protestant charismatic anthropology of Christianity in terms of theor theoretical offerings, and I felt incredibly constrained or would have to misrepresent my ethnographic data in order to fit it into that type of theological, uh, theoretical um, framework. And I actually found historians of Christianity to be much more helpful in terms of offering me theology, especially the works of Peter Brown, for example. So he was also talking about a time period where ancient Christianity, late antique Christian, um, Christianity in the Mediterranean world when the shift is happening. So when we're talking about changes in post-Marxism, something of a cataclysmic change where the thesis of secularization was supposed to head one way, this unexpectedness, it could not have been handled with the theoretical um, trajectory that was provided to us just only within Western Christian uh, anthropology. So I'm very happy and helped by historical anthropology, history of Christianity, as well as um, a complete different engagement with ethnographic material, which informs then theoretical frameworks. Thank you. Others on the panel? Candace, do you mind um, repeating which part of the question you want that, um, what was the question that you'd want us to, that you were responding to? Is it about the kind of the relevance of our conversation to our political present? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I guess I have some thoughts to um, offer. I, I'm writing, um, you know, writing this, talk this week or this presentation this week was a challenge because there was a way in which um, so much of, and I'm speaking in the uh, for the American audience and the American authors here, I don't mean to assume that anybody is um, necessarily absorbed in, in the politics of this week in the US, but there's a way in which, you know, these, the question of kind of um, what it means to, um, claim a popular kind of uh, um, grounds for legitimacy, um, the, the, even the mechanism of kind of electoral um, um, college voting. Um, there, there, there's a way in which my, it doesn't seem that some of my questions um, in this paper were in direct conversation with, with how to think about a body politic of national belonging, but I do think that um, what would be powerful in an anthropology of Christianity and, and really an anthropology of religion at large, it seems to me, is more of a direct engagement with um, what are considered to be normative kind of political frameworks for understanding, incorporating uh, citizens or uh, managing hierarchies of difference, um, reckoning with histories of oppression. I think um, it seems to me that orthod that there, there are um, theological reflections um, that are internal to theological logics of adjudicating justice and salvation that um, could be useful for as a critical resource for engaging what's going on politically. And um, I just wish that I, I wish we had more kind of explicit engagement uh, for framing those, those questions between theology and anthropology. Can I address something slightly different? Sure. Yes, because I'm, uh, I'm afraid uh, the situation, well, it's not good necessarily in the European Academy either, but you know, it's still different. But you know, I, I think since I'm the theologian in the panel, I would rather say that I'm an ethnographically engaged theologian. I'm interested in ethnographically engaged theology and not, not like theologically engaged anthropology as you say. And actually among theologians from different backgrounds, there is a new interest 
I would say not necessarily very much as far as I know in the anthropology of Christianity. I, I think it would be interesting to grasp why this uh, field of anthropology of Christianity has tended to focus on certain uh, religious traditions, on certain theological movements, uh, and, and not having much uh, dialogue with those working with in with empirical methods in religious studies, not theology, religious studies. So it's somehow unclear to me who is dialoguing with whom and with whom we are not dialoguing and why. But you know there is a, there is more inter more and more interest among theologians for lived religion. So I I guess it's easier for somebody with a theological education and and uh, and and, uh, and framework to to frame one's empirically grounded work as lived religion than anthropology of Christianity. So I that this is something I'm observing internationally also. Uh, and then another thing I think it's important to remember that when we speak of theology uh we can speak of uh, theology as an academic field with a very long history with a very different history in different uh christian churches even uh including the variety of theologies within that field of academic theology like i said feminist theology liberation theology queer theology black theology whatever and then second, theology is this kind of uh, intellectual self-understanding of Christian communities, churches, including the Orthodox Church. So the theology in that sense means the Orthodox theology as, uh, as understood by the institutional church. And third, what I was doing myself was navigating uh, between these two former understandings of theology, listening to my to ordinary people, or in my case women, by consciously because they are not formulating their orthodox theology otherwise. Uh, so in that sense, theology is theological reflection of anybody uh, who is uh, posing theological questions. So I think it's important that we make at least to some extent, this differentiation between the between the different understandings of theology. Absolutely, and I'd actually like to jump in um, and ask a question from Valentina Napolitano, who um, engaged in some of this conversation a bit. So she asks, um, you know, I see an interesting uh, growing more and more. Uh, an interest in of religious studies and divinity schools to quote unquote know and get more involved with the practice and analytics of ethnography. I'm not sure about the other way around in terms of how, how do anthropology departments, um, are they interested in engaging with theologies? It, you know, how, how are they? Um, and she said she would just love to hear um, the panelists on this uh, other way around um, the vector of intersectionality. I would just briefly comment that it's completely at the impetus of the, of the researcher. It's certainly something that, at least if you work in, in Ethiopia, um, places of sort of um, focused learning on topics of religion happen to be, um, not just actually within the sort of modern theological schools, but also with heavy, heavy presence of Catholic, Catholic institutes in various parts of Ethiopia uh, that actually study orthodoxy vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, in relation to the, ortho, uh, the Catholic tradition. And it's, it's some interesting um, frictions there as well, speak, speaking of frictions all, all day long here. But um, I would say that it's certainly de completely dependent on the, on the researcher to make, to make that reach, if you will, I mean, at least in my experience. Um, it's not something that's very much uh, facilitated or sort of positioned as preparation before doing field work, in my experience. Any others to comment? I 
if not, I'll move on to uh, the next question then. We have many, so these all will not definitely not all be answered, but uh, just to curate a conversation. So this question's from Robert Saylor. Um, he asks, this was directed to, to you, Alexandra, but I think that this is very relevant to other folks on the panel. Um, he'd like to hear a little bit more about anthropology's role um, as intervening in elite clerical dismissal of lay piety as quote unquote folklore. And I think it, this is what he says, I think it points to the tension within theology of who owns theological knowledge, um, the educated elite clerics um, or theologians for that matter, or the faithful outside of formal uh, theological training uh, guilds. And I, I want to just add to that in thinking about um, kind of the debate around orthodox rightness and kind of uh, proper theology, quote unquote. And this gets to, um, at least in the Coptic tradition, uh, kind of recent debate around theosis. And Angie, I know that you've engaged this question um, in your response to Sabah Mahmoud's um, religious difference in a secular age. And um, if other folks um, on the panel have kind of engagements from their own uh, fieldwork sites, uh, that would be wonderful to hear. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think in some ways, uh, at least I feel like I benefited in some ways of reading classic anthropology, that was something that was pushed, uh, not pushed, but you know, encouraged uh, as part of my um, PhD training to read those who are working in sort of what we now sort of pejoratively kind of classify as sort of studies of folk anthropology or like, you know, studies in Mexico in the 50s and in parts of uh, Southeast Asia, certainly parts of uh, uh, Mediterranean uh, that looked at what we now call everyday practices, but I think at the, at the time of uh, sort of anthropology would be pejoratively classed now as sort of folkloristic or, or fo folklore in the sense that anthropology sort of resists that category. Yet it's something that's very much a, a term that I find that circulates um, within contexts where Orthodox Christian communities exist. And again, I'm speaking mostly internationally. I, I don't know how this works in a place like United States, but in, in the context of Russia, Eastern Europe, sort of more classical countries that we understand as, as having Orthodox Christianity. Um, and in terms of how, how one, how the anthropologist plays a role of a mediator or a, a sort of a, a bridge, um, that's an interesting one. And I, I have to say, I'm still, sort of learning that um, as I go along and as I try to create encounters, um, <laughs> and I say that very formally, but create opportunities to where I can delve into the analytical framework that I, I, I produced for my, for my thesis and the work that I've done since then uh, with directly with a priest, people who are training to be priests. Um, and it's very much a you know heated discussion. And I, I don't think uh, and so I get also com completely specific to the person and their abilities to um, to accept uh, that body of ethnographic research as relevant. Um, and again, I just think it goes back to some earlier questions or comments made about I wish anthropologists and the the theologians or those theologically coming from the theological sciences uh, have a sort of common language, if that's the word. I mean, in some ways we would, you'd think we would, since we are talking about very common concepts here, but it's, it's the method of approaching the analysis and the argument that seems um, to create um, this inability to, 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 to kind of dialogue. Uh, at least that's the experience I've had so far. And, um, and I would just say that um, a lot of that has to do, if you, if you read in my paper, I try not to be too um, harsh, but a, a sort of antagonism, at least that I experienced. Again, those who are more um, uh, influenced and you know shaped by the church as institutionally, and through which they they understand their their sort of their the credentials, if you will. Um, and again, this is not as dominant with those that are people who are you know educate themselves on these topics, or perhaps those who would just formulate their own opinions that would definitely as, as, uh, remove themselves from the idea of being um, an authority. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have a, a nice answer for you, but just to say that, that more of those engagements have to happen to then sort of, I think, dismantle some of that, some of that bias as far as I'm concerned. Okay, 
Okay, we'll ask just a, a couple of more questions. Um, one being uh, focused on, I think, uh, Angie's engagement with um, coexistence. So this comes from John Doolin. Uh, he says that he's conducted ethnographic research on religious coexistence in Ethiopia. Uh, it is common for Sufi Muslims to participate in Orthodox practices that fall in these inclusive ritual zones, similar to what Ho describes um, like um, holy water springs. While Orthodox Christians seem to delight in Muslim participation, many of his Sufi interlocutors identified these practices as haram. So the question is, um, how does the inclusive potential of Orthodox the theologies look different when we place them alongside Muslim counterparts? How does articulation between Muslim and Christian praxis limit or expand the inclusive potential of the theologies you describe? And finally, do some corners of Orthodox theology enable more amicable articulations with Islamic theologies than others? Um, if anybody would like to comment. I mean, I suppose because there seems to be a common kind of interest in um, the politics of coexistence or kind of the role that the, the, the theologies or it sounds to me competing theologies can play in promoting or um, shaping the sh how coexistence um, might, uh, what, the, what the terms of coexistence might be um, in Ethiopia for, or within a community in Ethiopia, um, for example. And I think um, I should say a couple things. Um, I, when, I, when I gave this presentation, I, I tried my best to kind of um, ventriloquize what I think a theologically engaged anthropology might speak um, about. And so taking on theological doctrines and thinking about social questions um, was my tech, my approach. But, I, but if I were to kind of even do like a meta reflection of the presentation that I gave to you right now, even the, the term inclusion and inclusion of others is always from the, from um, if one were to have a kind of ecumenical stance um, and a stance for, of, of, try, of, 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 of an orientation um, and a commitment, an ethical commitment to saving everyone in the world, then the, the project of inclusion is universal and aspirationally total. You know, but for some, if I, if I had to reflect on that uh, proposal, <laughs> I would say also it's, it's problematic that the, that the, 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 the terms of inclusion um, within a kind of imagined in uni unified whole is also to it, you know, um, might also be a politically dangerous uh, project. Um, so that said, I, I just want to be clear that I'm not, I'm not, um, I myself am I'm critical of that aspiration. Um, it's certainly the case that um, there are competing forms and and imaginaries of what theological. Uh, what the theological basis of inclusion of others are in, in orthodoxy. So I, I imagine that there are more um, kind of uh, Muslim friendly orthodox theolo theological positions than, than um, certainly I can think even within um, the, the institution of the Coptic Orthodox Church, set, just setting aside the whole kind of industry of lived theology or, or kind of um, people quietly practicing the faith of Jesus Christ and not necessarily being a seminarian. But even among seminarians, I think there are and, 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 and figures within the Coptic Orthodox hierarchy. I would say that, that there are contests over um, of, 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 of what, what it means to kind of be an ethical and, and theological orientation towards Muslims. And it doesn't, one doesn't even really have to go to material practices of, of taking Bharata to, to do that work. Um, I think I, if, if there's, if it's okay, Candice, I don't know if there's time, but I also just want to kind of express a worry um, that I have with the, the term lived religion. And it's not, it's not to say that I think it's a, it's a bad term or that, you know, the work of lived religion is, um, is, is, is necessarily problematic. I, I think I'm only concerned that when within religious studies or 
um, theological divisions, anthropologists and ethnographers kind of become equated with the scholarship and lived religion, that there is a kind of seeding of theoretical and conceptual ground um, when, in case, when it is the case that anthropologists actually have the conceptual tools to engage um, the, the normative canons of, of, of theology proper. That is, if, if, one, if one thinks of anthropologists as being the specialist of folk and kind of on the ground practices and not of kind of um, the doctrinal industry of properly legitimate theology, there's a kind of, it seems to me, a concession that is made and I'm, I'm not willing to do that, I think. And I don't think anthropologists should be willing to do that. Um, so just saying that. Does anybody uh, want to respond to that? Or just to wrap up then, um, uh, Vlad Nomescu asked a pretty, um, I think a pretty simple and very uh, interesting question for us to think with. Um, he says, wonderful presentations. And one thing uh, that they show is the diversity of understandings of and approaches to theology. And hence, one's engagement becomes somehow arbitrary, sometimes even unfortunate, as Elena pointed out. So what motivated your own engagement with theology? And what was your starting point? So getting a little personal, just, you know, to, to end this panel and um, see everybody off. I think maybe I'll speak a little bit here because I think there was another question who, which focused on me as a, an Orthodox believer, as well as an, an anthropologist, what does it mean to do work? Um, and I think being, being an Orthodox Christian faith believer inevitably forces you to engage with some kind of theology because it informs the personal practices that I engage in, whether it's fasting or daily prayers or prostrations, following a, a church calendar or participating in taking in, in, in the sacraments. So I think that position I say had given me a lot of access into, so for example, um, I was born and raised in Ethiopia. So my understanding of religion is through osmosis. You go to church, you participate in rituals. It's only in, in my twenties that I became a serious reader of the Philokalia or the Desert Fathers. So that's my entryway into Orthodox, a mature Orthodoxy where it was an inherited religion, but for me as an individual, who have to reckon with it as a female, as a black person, as a person who's living in a diasporic community of believers and who engages with Antiochian, Coptic and Greek Orthodox. What does it mean for me to be a believer as well as an anthropologist? So my foray into these kinds of questions started just with engagement of how do people understand illness from a spiritual perspective and mostly focusing on Orthodox Christians who still believed in spirit possessions and the existence of spirits, but their engagement showed me the, the rationality of what, which types of theologies they adopt and which they discard in informing themselves as what kind of um, um, engagements that they would have to do, whether it's with a czar practitioner or with a exorcist, they would have to make decisions based on their understanding of what the etiology of their illnesses are. So that engagement, that understanding, of course, it has also opened doors for me where my identity as an Orthodox is constantly questioned as a person who's an insider or an, or an outsider who has access because it is my home. It is my right as an Orthodox Christian to be uh, allowed into such spaces and to be hearing such things. So that had also given me a certain access where had I initially, I was doing research between Pentecostal Christians as well as Orthodox Christians. And that already made me uh, suspect, are you taking some kind of sacred knowledge or inner knowledge? And as an anthropologist, does that mean I'm as a 
just a secular subjectivity or am I a religious subjectivity which have to juggle two types of different methodologies and subjectivities um, and like how Dr. Antonin was saying, how if the anthropologist is on the spotlight, how would our interlocutors engage with us? How would they ask us about our faith commitments and who are we in responding to that question? I think uh, figuring out those answers could help us get insight into the practices um, of our interlocutors as well as who we are as ethnographers as well as as believers. I think in my case, I have to answer uh, the other way around. What made me be interested in uh, ethno ethnography as a theologian, as a person trained in theology? And I think uh, there are several reasons, but uh, I did my dissertation on Latin American liberation theology from a feminist perspective, actually. And I lived uh, several years in Costa Rica. And, and I think already then I noticed uh, both in Latin American liberation theology and most of feminist theology, a lack of, uh, you know, it, it was very text and doctrine and philosophically oriented critique of traditional religion, whether from the perspective of Latin America or from a gender perspective. Uh, and then on the other hand, in gender studies, <clears throat> I have also worked in the gender studies department. You know, the, 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 the lack of understanding of the role and meaning and the multiple meanings of religion for women or in relation to gender uh, is a problem in itself. You know, religions are seen as patriarchal, monolithically patriarchal, women as victims and so on. You all know that. And then in uh, traditional theology, including theologies of religious institutions, women's voices are not included. So I guess this triangle that even feminist theologies do not really employ women's voices, it's, it's very sophisticated feminist critique of, uh, of uh, doctrines. So I think that made I really came to a point that I wanted to listen to women, very different women with very different backgrounds, different religious traditions, uh, uh, with different levels of education, you know, to see and consider women as theological agents, as theological thinkers, and give that, you know, somehow see that as an authoritative voice, since it has not been heard. By anybody. So I guess that was my, and the way to do that is to, to interview. I'm not working, doing full ethnography in the States as you guys are, but you know, I did learn uh, in our anthropology department, you know, eth ethnographic methods and ethnographic thinking and interpretation. <clears throat> Thank you, Elena. Um, I think we're going to wrap up now, but before we do, um, I'd just like to acknowledge the presence of, of Sonia Lerman in this conversation um, and just to remember her um, and, um, you know, uh, just to think of her um, as, we, as we wrap up um, and the ways in which she's influenced this conversation. So thank you all for uh, being a part of this great conversation and we look forward to continuing it in the future. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you.